Robert van Nieuwenburg, <laughs> um, who is going to be talk talking about representation learning for quantum systems. Go ahead. Thank you, Agnes. Well done on the pronunciation. Um, good morning, everyone. How many of you were at the school? Good, because I'm hoping I, I've kept the talk a little bit more accessible, I hope. Um, so please also feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Um, and you know, basic questions, but for the, for the experts, if you want to ask more detailed questions, please do that too. Um, representation learning for quantum systems, what I want to talk about. And let me um, start by checking if you're all awake. I'm giving you, I'm very proud of this animation. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to solve this question starting now. I have to show this because of the animation. Anyone wants to take a guess or, know the, or knows the answer? What did you do in your mind No, I think it, uh, if I didn't make a mistake, the answer should be a little bit easier. <laughs> but, well, so what did you do in your brain when I asked you this question? Yeah, so you, you, you transformed the Roman numerals to numbers, Arabic, Arabic numbers, exactly. And then, and then the answer should have been this. Then, okay, so then, then I will, def I mean, this is my mistake, but I wanted to deflect it. I just took this literally from this book. This is, I'm not, I did not make up this. Sorry? 221, you're right, yes. Okay, 221 divided by nine was then probably the answer you had. Well done. Yeah. So there, here's the importance of, uh, of having representations, but also having having correct representations. Here's another one that uh, this is not a question anymore. Here is, um, here is um, an important practical representation. This is about how, how you represent lists in, in memory, um, where if I asked you to insert the number six into a list uh, in the bottom left here, if I give you a data structure, this is for computer scientists, but if, you, if I give you a data structure that is a so-called linked list, where you can only ask for the next and the previous element in memory, then to find the number six, you have to start somewhere and um, do order of n operations to find where to insert the six. Whereas if I had given you this data structure in a binary tree, uh, where you can always ask larger or smaller, um, left and right, um, you can do this in, uh, in log n operations, okay? And it's the same data, it's the same task. I'm just listing these to highlight the importance of representations. And I'm sure you're all aware of this, but I want to drive that point home. So here, very practically, um, data structure representation is important. And for those of you who were at the school, here's an example that you have also seen, right? The same is true also for things that we do in physics in, in tensor networks, right? You have a representation of your wave function which is exponentially large, which is, which is uh, a problem if you want to go to large systems. Um, but it turns out that, that at least for some types of systems, actually you can do this for all types of systems, you can always have this representation where you decompose this exponentially large number uh, of elements, this tensor, into something that has fewer, right? Did you all see this in Miles' talk, right? Where D is this bond dimension, this is the dimension of these matrices. You can always do that. In the worst case, these matrices have to be, again, exponentially large, and then you don't win anything. But it's a good representation because for some states, um, with not too much entanglement, this representation is also useful. Okay? It's not only different, but it's also useful in that sense. So then, in general, it's a bit of a vague question, perhaps, but um, finding a good representation then depends on what you want to do with it. Um, and then we need to define what is a good representation. Okay. Um, many people have asked this question, but I think a useful one for me is if it's a representation that I can use 
to solve a task, okay? So I'm not just asking how do I represent this data, but I want to do X, Y, or Z with this. How do I find a good representation for that? And so making a subsequent task easier. And then there's many, many things you can say here. It's, it's either easier to interpret, that's what I will focus on a little bit in the next uh, example. Maybe it's less memory, tensor networks, for example. Maybe it has other properties like being more symmetric. Maybe also for tensor networks, it's easier to manipulate. And I can also have any or all of the above, right? I might maybe want to have one that is less memory uh, um, um, or more memory efficient and easier to manipulate both and have them all in the same park. And then um, this is a very standard thing that people nowadays do in semi-supervised learning, which is also relevant if you have data, for example, from experiments where some samples have labels and many do not because they're perhaps expensive. You have to have a, a human label the data or maybe it's easy to generate a whole bunch of samples and then uh, some of them have class labels. And then what do you do in such cases or a thing to do in cases um, where you have this separation, few labeled samples, many unlabeled ones, is to take the unlabeled ones, learn a representation from that, we'll come back to this in a moment, and then with that representation learn uh, or solve the supervised task where you do have the labels. Um, so this allows you to sort of do bootstrapping. You can then um, also extend that. Once you have learned it from that representation, you can assign labels to the unlabeled data set. It's a very interesting topic, semi-supervised learning is what it's called. There's also self-supervised learning in this setting. Um, if this applies to you, if you have experimental data, this is worth trying. Uh, now, I, I said representation, I said learning representation. So far, for example, if you think about tensor networks, it's a representation that we have come up with uh, as humans, uh, the same for the data structures. Um, but for a lot of learning tasks, when it comes to deep learning, the idea is that we would like to extract such a representation from the data. Okay, this is what representation learning is all about. And if you have been doing machine learning, you have all been doing representation learning, uh, maybe just not very explicitly. Okay. So here's, I took this um, from uh, this quote because I like it from the website that I show here. The idea therefore is to learn a representation, uh, but make this now explicit by, by um, embedding it as a separate step in a learning routine. Um, here it says, is a representation learning is a process in machine learning where algorithms extract meaningful patterns. We'll come to that in a second ago. Also, what, what meaningful means from raw data to create representations that are easier to understand and process. Maybe interpret even. Um, so that's what the next sentence says actually. Representations can be, can be designed for interpretability if you care. They can reveal hidden features or they can be used for transfer learning. They can be used for many more things like single shot learning um, uh, if you're um, interested in doing that. Again, if you have very costly data or very costly experiments that give you um, few data samples, that might be interesting. So the idea really is to have this learning of the representation as an explicit step. And one way of doing that um, is dimensionality reduction using, in this case, an autoencoder. Did you, does everyone who does not know what an autoencoder is? Nice, okay, good, no one, or, or those of you who don't know, don't dare say it. Um, an autoencoder is a very simple thing where some data goes in, you compress the data, uh, and you also decompress it, and then you just compare the output with the input, and you tweak the weights of this, um, of this network so that the output resembles the input as close as possible. Just reconstruction, reconstruction loss. This uh, narrowing and going back out is called an information bottleneck. Um, and this central layer, I will call, I mean, some people, many people call it feature space or latent space, I'll use probably both. Typically I call this latent space and then the layer, the variables, the numbers in this layer are called latent variables. Okay. Um, and so we can, we can then start playing around with this type of network um, where we have typically this inherent trade-off, right? I could, if I make this network 
large enough in some sense or expressive enough. And I'm, there's, also, there's all kinds of practical things that I'm sweeping under the rug here, right? I'm assuming that these neurons have some fixed precision. They're not infinitely, uh, infinitely precise because otherwise I could stuff everything. It's an important point. I could stuff everything into one neuron if I just you know, take each sample of my input and code it into some set of numbers and have this single neuron just learn by heart all these samples by putting the representation as digits behind the comma, right? If you know about space filling curves, this is what it would be doing. But that requires that you have one number with infinite precision, uh, and we don't have that. Um, so when I talk about large enough, I just mean a large enough network, uh, many, many neurons. I'm just showing a small example here. I can then try to make this information bottleneck a little bit smaller, constrain it, force it, force it to represent whatever I give as input in fewer and fewer numbers. Typically, there's a good middle point, or all the way, all the way to you know maybe one single number in some cases, where nice properties could mean it's interpretable. I can use the same representation for several tasks, interoperable, um, um, different properties that you might think that you might call nice, which again depends on the on the task that you're considering. So here's a task that we considered. Um, I give you a simple, very simple two qubit density matrix, which I generate according to some simple circuit. And I would ask you, um, I allow you to represent this internally in your brain with one single number, okay? So I give you the density matrix, you can extract one single number, and then after you've done that, I give you many samples to learn from, um, I will then ask you for that single number, and then based on that single number, you need to reconstruct as well as you can the density matrix that corresponded to that single number. Does anyone want to take a stab at what you would do for this particular case? Yeah? Yeah, it's the angle, what were you, what were you going to say? Quaternions, okay, yeah. <laughs> also, oh, no, that's not a bad representation for matrices. Uh, anyone else? Who agrees with angle? Many, many people. So in this case, the exact, that's exactly it. It's a little bit of a silly question. If, if I give you this matrix, if you, if you um, get many of these matrices, of course, with, with fixed numbers, with alphas, some numbers, so these are literally floating point numbers, you could hopefully learn from that that there's this one generative factor, so it's called, which is the alpha, which is the angle alpha, right? So if you were to take many such matrices, squeeze it through an autoencoder with one latent variable, we did that, and I don't have, I'm not going to show you that result here, but you, it does exactly that. It learns, it learns to just extract this angle, okay? That's not very interesting. Um, so instead, we scramble that uh, by scrambling with higher um, measure unitary operators um, so that the numbers that you get in this matrix are now no longer recognizable as that angle. What do you think happens then? Yeah? On each of the individual ones, yeah, so explicitly that indeed. Yeah, so I'm, we're not scrambling something that is still left in this representation. And if you figure out what that is, then you will have the answer. Yeah. Yeah, for a, given, for a given alpha, for a given angle, for each shot, we would do different random unitaries. Yeah, okay. So the answer to that is what I'm going to um, go through now. Of course, we had some expectations. We had some maybe, you know, hopes for what would come out. Um, the bottom line is we as humans are doing something useful. Uh, already, that's uh, I can. I'll show you in a second. That's uh, that's a good thing. So here's how here's how that um, would work. The same model we had before, just to show you the whole pipeline. Um, if we take this data set as input, the, the MNIST uh, numbers, we would also compress that uh, and then decompress it. 
you would get some representation in this uh, middle space. In this case, it would be a two-dimensional uh, one that I'm showing here. Um, and we have colored here the different classes, the different numbers in the data set with different colors. And so you can see in this case, if you didn't have those colors, this result is not particularly useful um, because it doesn't cluster, but it is intuitive because now if you do, imagine if you did have the numbers like we do here, you can see some relations that, uh, I mean, it's, it's a little bit small perhaps here, but um, that some numbers that look alike um, are close together in, these, in this space. And I just want to show you this so uh, that you have an idea of what we're doing. So now what we're going to do is replace this data set of, of numbers with those density matrices, okay? And then see what this latent space um, will look like. Generate many of those scrambled uh, as a function also of, of this alpha. So what comes out of this circuit would be a pure state. We turn it into a density matrix um, with alpha because later we will want to also include mixed states. Um, and then uh, embed this into a latent space um, of two dimensions for this particular representation. And what comes out is such a structure, not always the same, but something that looks quite ordered and structured. I'm showing you here also already some colors, but even without these colors, it's a very, it's a compact shape. It seems to have some symmetry, right? Maybe two lines going through. Um, so already if you do this simple autoencoder on such a simple data set, you get some structure. Is the, is the pipeline clear? Yeah, great. Um, so there's structure, but we don't have a handle on this. We would like to have a way of tuning or just playing around with how, with this information bottleneck, apart from just asking maybe one number, two numbers, three numbers. Uh, also for a given set of two numbers or one number, we would want to have a handle on, on the representation that it learns. And so the way of doing that is by what we did so far um, is go, I'll come back later to what state of the art is now is to do a variational autoencoder. Have you seen variational autoencoders? Also a lot of nodding, great. So in a variational autoencoder, uh, for each latent variable that I, uh, I, I, I think of doubling them, um, I now don't predict that latent variable, but I interpret this prediction as uh, predicting the mean and standard deviation of some normal distribution. Okay. For, so for each input that goes in, I compress it with some encoder network and I interpret that middle layer as means and standard deviations of normal distributions, okay? I'm just showing you one here. If I had two latent variables, um, two of the Zs I'm showing you here uh, or in the previous slides, I would, so for two, I would have four, I would have four numbers here, right? Two means and two sigmas. Um, and uh, I didn't tell you this, uh, didn't show you this before, but in words, that's exactly what I did here. Density matrix goes in, some gets compressed down to some numbers and gets uh, decompressed and some other density matrix comes out or something that we interpret again as a density matrix. And we're just doing the mean squared error between those two element wise, okay? Minimizing that means that it tries to reconstruct as well as it can what goes in and with what comes out, right? Um, but because we have now this middle layer, um, this variational autoencoder, we also have this um, extra loss term, which I will call now a regularization term. And what it does, forget about the beta for now, what it does is it tries to keep this middle layer, this distribution, as close as it can to a normal, to a standard um, Gaussian distribution. So mean zero and standard deviation one. I'm not going to go into why this makes sense or how this leads to more interpretable or uh, actually disentangled latent representations. This is a very standard thing that you do with variational autoencoders. And there's an extension of that, which is this um, beta variational autoencoder. Um, and this is the, the thing that we are going to tune. So this is going to put relevance on how strong do we want to have this representation be regularized. Again, if beta is zero, we're back to an autoencoder. And if it's one or larger than one or larger than zero, we are trying to enforce some statistical independence 
I'm not explaining this, but this is what it does, some statistical independence on the different latent variables. Okay. So it tries to say, if this latent variable changes property X in my data set, then the other one, if I have two latent variables, had better try to change something different than that, uh, different than whatever the first latent variable is changing. Okay. With, go for it. That's right, yeah, yeah. So the question was indeed if you have more, if you have more latent variables, then I am trying, what I'm trying to do with them is to have them all in the, separately, each of the latent variables, each of those pairs be uh, uncorrelated standard distributions. Yeah, more questions, sorry, yeah, in the back first, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this is exactly. So the, the, your question is if the number of input layers is the number of elements in a density matrix, that's what we did, yes. So I think what Marin talked about, for example, would be a, a different representation where from these density matrices, you first measure two body reduced density uh, matrices and then use those as input. This, what we do here indeed, obviously will not scale to large qubit systems because you are feeding in the whole density matrix. Um, but in, like, you, know, you, you can also do a representation learning of that first and feed that as input. Uh, there's many ways of, that we can try to reduce that. But for here, it's, we're going to focus on this interpretability and not so much on scaling this to very large systems. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. Another question, yeah. Yeah. If they are over-parameterized, What happens, so you're asking what happens if you have more latent variables than you have generative factors? Yeah. Um, ideally, what will happen is that they all become redundant. They all start being copies of each other, and you, and you, and you see that, you detect that. In the worst case, um, if you don't regularize properly, they're going to learn, depending on your activation functions, but they might learn all some, uh, to some I'm sorry, some nonlinear weird combinations of that input uh, of the generative factor, and then, and then you know, that's a bad situation because you have difficulty keeping them all apart, yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Keep the questions coming, that's great. Um, so, recap, uh, plus, plus a small uh, demonstration there. Density matrices, scrambled density matrices go in. Um, we, we, in this case, give the latent space, uh, we give it a, an eight-dimensional latent space. Um, and then we start tuning data. So we, we train on the same data set several different models with different datas and then check. Uh, so on the x-axis here are the latent um, variables, actually the, the, the means, the mu's latent variables, and the color, and the y's axis is the beta, the color code says for each of those latent variables, how much did it contribute to this kullback leipler loss. Uh, and we've sorted them from left to right uh, in high or low intensity. So you see that for this data set with the scrambled row, it almost never, it's very faint, but it almost never uses more than three latent variables. Um, and, um, and more interestingly, there is a range in beta space, let's call it, which I see, okay. There's a range in beta space where it finds a one dimensional representation which is what I asked you before, find me, represent these, data, these density matrices with just one number, okay? Um, so let's take a look at one of them. Here 0 0.75, I think, was the, the right thing. The beta space, beta has shifted. And then we look at, um, so we're still plotting. It has eight latent variables. We're still plotting number one and number two, just to get a visualization. And clearly something happened. And that was also the right interpretation of this plot, namely something happened, okay? There's, there's clearly some structure here that we can still exploit. So let's investigate that a little bit more. Now let's take that one latent number, number, well, the first one we called that zero, 
and plot it against what we have the data, so we know for each sample what the alpha was. Remember this was a, it's very small, but this was the circuit with alpha. And we see these two lines. So there's, there's, you know, there, there's clearly a symmetry that we did not yet remove from the system, but that's okay. Um, does anyone, this is a question for the information theorist, does anyone recognize what such a curve as a function of this and, you know, alpha would be? Yeah, yeah. So what alpha does, uh, so the an an answer that Benoit gave was entropy. What alpha does, of course, if alpha is zero, I never explained the circuit properly, apologies. If alpha is zero, I never do a rotation, and I just have two non-entangled qubits. If alpha is so that I do exactly a, f a bit flip on the second one, then this circuit is exactly the circuit that generates a bell state, so I have maximally entangled states. So between, between here and pi, I go from a non-entangled state to a maximally entangled state. And then a measure for two qubits specifically that we already knew is, for example, the concurrence, which concurrence is not, you know, it's, it's not easy to calculate per se. You have to first compute this matrix R, for which you have to do the, the, the square root of the density matrix. Sorry, I, I just realized you, know, you don't see my uh, cursor on this screen. I've been pointing at all kinds of things. That, uh, <laughs> Um, the density matrix R, which you first have to do a transformation with sigma y's, take square roots, and then of this R, you compute the eigenvalues, and then it's this function, the max of this, with the uh, largest eigenvalue minus the other ones. And there's also this, yeah, go for it. Um, so first, we, okay, I'll come to that in a second. Um, for concurrence, actually, it turns out it's the same thing for, as, as negativity for two qubits. Thank you. Got it. This is, uh, I cannot help, this is the joke that I, a science teacher once told me that how do you distinguish experimentalists from theorists? Is you give them a laser pointer, <laughs> exactly. You give them a laser pointer and the theorist does this to see if it works and the experimentalist that. I, I'm a, I am more of a theorist, but uh, I've learned not to do this anymore. Um, so it's not easy to compute, so, but, but this curve, so we, how we found this is looking at, you know, we expect it because we are scrambling only locally, we expect that things like non-local information between two qubits, so things like entanglement entropy would be preserved. So we intuitively already knew that we should be looking for entanglement properties. Uh, and then, you know, there's not that many that you compute for two qubits. And so here, um, this, is, this is the one that we knew to look for. Other questions? Okay. Um, and so this curve, it's not exactly the same. You see there is some, some linear shift in the latent variable. It, this thing starts at zero symmetric, and so you have to, there's a linear transformation that you have to do on that, but it's, it's a monotone in both cases. So if, you now, if we now take you know, the value for, for a given uh, representation for here, the value of the concurrence as a color, then, then uh, this, oops, then, um, then you, know, you, you, you again see that there is some structure. It's the same color that I showed you in the very first plot where you have, with the autoencoder, you also see that you know, moving towards larger Z0, you get more concurrence, and at Z0 in the middle, I don't have any labels here, it, it is also zero. So this representation clearly is entanglement information. So if I told you, um, I, if this was something else, I would have been, E perhaps even more excited because it means that what we have been using as representation for two qubits as a single number um, should maybe not have been entanglement information. Maybe, I, maybe this, this compression method, this quote unquote AI would have come up with some other number that we should have been looking at. Here, at least it confirms that things like concurrence or negativity, um, which is the same for two qubits, works. And what I'm not showing you here is that this thing works also for density matrices for mixed states, which is the nice thing about concurrence. So for, the, for the expert, concurrence works for two qubit mixed states, same as negativity. Um, but there are cases for which negativity um, no longer works. If you go to more than two qubits, three also works, but, or if you go to qdits, for example, uh, then in those cases, we don't have uh, I see someone who maybe disagrees. Good. 
The other way around, did I say it the other way around? Okay. Yeah, so concurrence is only for two qubits, is that right? correct? Sorry, I missed that. Uh, negativity works for others, but if I'm not mistaken, also if I go to larger systems, maybe more qubits or qubits coupled to qubits, does negativity still work? There is a there is a there is a, a shrug question. So ideally, we would try. Of course, we next thing that we would do is we didn't do that yet is try it and see what happens. What what set of numbers? Because if you have more qubits, you can make more bipartitionings. Would this method come up with as rep for representations? Um, just to show you, I already flashed it before. Of course, it's interesting to also now look at what happens at other points. Can you could you, could we have seen this just from looking at those? And and the answer is yes. So here you see the representation, it comes up with, at, if you have three latent variables, we're just showing two here. Interesting, you know, if you have the colors, if you didn't have the colors, this would not be any, any informative at all. But, but there is this point at 0 0.75 where you have these two latent variables and you have this very clear um, one dimensional representation, again, also separated from in, in color scale. Okay. Um, we did try some things just to see if this two qubit thing works um, for subsystems of three qubits. This is a, just as a check. So we also know how to make three qubit entangled states, in this case, W-like entanglement. For those you know, not going into detail here, this is a W state. Um, and you can also parameterize those with some angle so that for a zero, you again have three separable qubits. And if you add, if you increase alpha, you get more and more like a um, fully mixed, maximally entangled state, sorry. Um, and then with three qubits, like I said, you, you can now start thinking about um, you know, the bottom two, let's call them A, B, C. How are, are B and C, what is the entanglement between group B and C with the first and, and all the other subsets? And for that, of course, in this case, Maybe this should have been called negativity, but this also, um, again, works. So there you see the correlation of this latent variable. We didn't take out, so this absolute value is to take out that symmetry that you saw in both directions. And they're nicely, very linearly correlated, again, with concurrence um, here. Okay, so, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, they're asking, can I tell you a bit more about this linear so, uh, uh, correlation? So think, go back to the two qubit case where we now we, we talk about concurrence. And then if you make the same plot of this latent variable as, and plot it against concurrence, if there is a linear relation between the two, then they're clearly linearly correlated. So one is a linear rescaling of the other, right? So this is how we checked. Is, is that latent variable indeed doing something like concurrence? And if it's linear, then, then yes. So I think you should turn this question around. And it's, this is a confirmation that whatever Z is doing is linearly related to the concurrence. Right? If, this was not, if this was not a linear relation, then Z was not concurrence. It would have been something else. Does that make sense? I can, yeah, 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 that's right. I cannot, I cannot prove that it's exactly computing concurrence, but whatever it's computing is linearly correlated with that. But you're right, it could, uh, I, I don't, yeah, you're right. It could, it's a coincidence perhaps, um, but the interpretation is that concurrence therefore is probably the, the number you should be computing as a human too to do this representation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So this, yeah, it is true. So that's why, I mean, that's why we have eight here. So for this four by four, you would, or you would need eight if you want to fully capture the whole density matrix indeed. 
And if I turn beta off entirely, um, so to go to zero, and without and, and including the scrambling, you're right. You would need eight latent variables, and you you could um, then have one latent variable, like learning the elements of density matrix, right? So this would be, I think, this is what you mean, and and then you can see exactly that. Here, what happens, for example, in these cases where you have a little bit more, um, it. I think, if I'm not mistaken, but I should also look at uh, Felix, Felix, where's Felix up there, he, he did all that. You will find that it, it starts learning exactly this redundant information. So th I think you're right, if you remove this, if you remove the data, and you're really just forcing it to do a perfect reconstruction, then you get this result. But any, as soon as you include data, it, you introduce this bottleneck, and you, um, you see that it starts finding other combinations. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, that it lear that it learns those features. Yeah, maybe there. Yeah, May Yeah, I don't think we ever truly looked at all of these and see if if if, for example, those would map to other preserved information. Maybe we didn't. We did not check. We can. I'm happy to try. Yeah. More. Because then I w would want to um, go to a few other very quick quick statements or quick things. So what what for representation learning has emerged as as a useful thing to do nowadays, uh, state of the art, is to do contrastive learning. Contrastive learning uh, doesn't have to be for representation learning per se, but it turns out it gives you good representations, useful ones to do other things with. And so for contrastive learning, the idea really, which is capturing the same information, uh, the same statement as with the variational autoencoder, is that you're trying to take inputs, you're trying to map all of the inputs into a latent space, but now I try a different way to make sure that if the inputs are similar, they end up close in the latent space, and they end up far away if they're dissimilar in that latent space. And here, contrastive learning does that explicitly. So instead of saying, I want to do that by trying to have uncorrelated Gaussians. Here I'm really saying, uh, I'll explain this in a second, I'm really saying in that latent space, I introduce some distance measure, and I'm trying to then maximize the distance between dissimilar samples uh, and minimize them between similar inputs. And then, then, of course, I need to have a way of saying which inputs are similar or dissimilar. And you do that by picking an example of your data set, which we call the anchor. And then compared to that, I pick two other samples. One I could pick from the same distribution that I you know, call the positive sample, one that I know is, is similar. Could be this picture, but with noise. It could be one that I know is uh, supposed to be another type of dog. Um, and I also pick one that is dissimilar, um, maybe because I pick, I'd just take it from a different distribution or because it's a different animal, right? I use the same encoder to bring them into a latent space. So each of these pictures is now represented as a feature vector, this latent vector. Um, one for the positive sample, for the anchor, and for the negative sample. And then I try to, um, to make the, maybe I should have flipped these, but it depends on if this is a distance or not, but I try to make the anchor and the negative sample as far apart as I can, and the anchor and the positive sample as close as, as I can, right? This turns out to work really well. Um, and so what we're trying now um, is to do this exactly on um, these systems, on circuits, now not with two qubits, but with six qubits, or maybe more or less, for these measurement-induced phase transitions. And I think maybe you've seen a little bit about that in previous talks. But the intuitive idea, I think, here is very simple. If I have a circuit where I don't do any measurements, I likely, at the end, get some, some state that, has, that is entangled, has some measure of entanglement. Probably if I do this with random, random unitaries, random harm measures, I get to some uh, volume law entangled state. Um, and intuitively, if I now start measuring everywhere, in particular at the output, then I get the product state. And so I, I get lower entanglement. And somewhere in the middle between not measuring at all or measuring always, there happens to be a transition between when the average circuit with measurements is area law or volume law. 
If you're not familiar with that, don't worry about it. It's just the saying, how does the, how does the entanglement scale with the number of qubits? So we do this, we do the same thing. We pick a density matrix. The negative one is with measurements, and the other one is the same circuit but scrambled. Um, and uh, encode that, and very, sorry, a very preliminary but also intuitive result is immediately what you find is it, it starts dis distinguishing those two classes. What I didn't tell you is that the um, measurements are happen with some probability that I'm not showing you here just because it's preliminary and intuitive, hopefully. But immediately the representation that you find in one dimension already gives you um, those that are very entangled versus those that are area law entangled. And I hope this is also intuitive. There is then a way of doing explainability on these, looking at individual pixels. Um, but what you, see, what you see here is a density matrix of six qubits. And the dominant features that it looks at for determining is it area law or for volume law. And I think, you know, I hope no one, it's a, it's a simple but important result. But I hope no one um, disagrees that for volume law, you'll probably have to look at many more entries. Then time, my time is up. I think the last thing I wanted to quickly show you um, is because I cannot help not, I have to talk a little bit about quantum games. Um, this is quantum game. So I think um, my favorite playground for thinking about representation learning is in quantum control problems, quantum error correction. Um, you all know, hopefully, this card pull problem in reinforcement learning, where you have a stick and you try to balance it, right? Um, you, you can make a quantum version of that um, and then have a, a reinforcement learning agent try to control that system. I'm not going to explain exactly how that works um, with all the weak measurements and the control. But here, too, um, you can think about how does an agent, how does a reinforcement learning agent, given, for example, the wave function or weak measurements, what is the representation it uses for, for doing that? Same thing with quantum error correction, which can be on the surface code, the Torah code, or color code can be interpreted as a, as a single player game that you can also play with a reinforcement learning agent. And again, there is a neural network in the brain of this agent. And you can ask, what is the representation uh, there? There's also a few other games that I would encourage you to check out. Um, there are less, you know, those, those are more entertainment type of games, but still making an AI for chess is already a difficult problem. Um, we all know alpha zero now, or mu zero even. Um, there's an extension of quantum of chess in which you have some set of quantum rules. There's a whole, there is some, something called quantum game theory, combinatorial quantum game theory. So you can, you can add, you can embed this with a lot of mathematical rigor. But the AI for such games had better also find a representation for these states of the system. Uh, and it's interesting for me at least to think about what would, the, what would that representation be. So um, any further questions, please feel free to find me here or reach out. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot for this great talk. Um, are there any more questions? Hi. Uh, for the contrastive learning, yeah. what kind of... Uh, so I know there's the self-supervised contrastive learning where we... Uh, augment the data by cropping or adding noise or rotating yeah. in order to not have labels. Yeah. So uh, my question is, uh, how, uh, like, how little can we have uh, of similar data? Because like, there's a limit on how much we can augment the data before we kind of like, crop out all the information or like, transform it way too uh, wrong. Yeah. And the other question is, if it's maybe like 100 uh, variation of the same data point, is it possible, for example, to train a 100 autoencoder on density matrix, and then we have 100 different embeddings. Maybe the autoencoders have different kernels or different, uh, just by randomly you know, learning different embeddings. And then now we can use these embeddings for contrastive learning. 
Yeah, okay, so, okay, two questions. The first one, I, I think the first one really probably depends on the exact problem, if I understood correctly, like how many, how low can you go in terms of number of samples? Yeah. For, the, for data points, I, I don't think I have a good rule of thumb for this. I think there's probably a little bit trial and error. Um, is that, do I understand that correctly? Is yeah, because yeah, um, I've, like, I've seen papers with like, few uh, tens to hundreds, and I've seen papers with like 100,000 different uh, for each data point, so I was yeah. like, it's way too different. Uh, yeah, so I think, I think a good approach to that, if you, if you can get more data, get more data. I think the one thing we clearly see is more is better, even for these small systems. Uh, but I, for, like for this particular case, I don't remember exactly, but 10 is not enough. A million is probably more than you need, but somewhere in between is a good point where you find stable representations. Uh, so that was that was one. For the second question, there is there is more um, I think to add, because a lot of it also for us, for example, here depends on the specific loss function. So I I didn't spend time on this, but um, we we did the, I'll keep it short. We did the mean squared error element wise on the density matrices. Now there's more off diagonals than there are diagonals. So in this mean squared error, we are already emphasizing that it should be looking at the, the off diagonals more, just from the loss function for reconstruction. So with that choice, we're already biasing it a little bit towards looking at off diagonals, right? Uh, so we, we, what, we're trying, what we're also trying to investigate now is what happens if we already do different input representations. So I'll change the representation that we give it instead of the density matrix do what Marin did, the two body density matrices, or some other set of POVM measurements, right? And I think this is what you're getting to a little bit, is that then if you, because that already means we have a different representation that we're feeding it, feeding this, this autoencoder, right? And so I think there's definitely an interesting idea to train many different autoencoders and use those as inputs to, to the representation learning scheme, yeah. Thank you. Are there any more questions? You can also shout and I can repeat yeah, it, maybe, but yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But if in our case, for the, in the contrastive learning, the negative samples were those with measurements. No, no, I think, no, we're just trying to, we're trying to, we just say, some samples, like, is it similar to the anchor or not? And the anchor did not have the measurements, and the other one did have the measurements. And then, so we're not telling it explicitly that, you know, it's volume law or area law, even though very likely with measurements you get to the area law. Um, but, but yeah, there, there's no, yeah, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a very simple step, I think, still. But if this didn't work, then something was wrong. Are there any more questions? That note, I also wanted to ask, um, so, so regarding the question just now, yeah. um, if you want to learn something that goes beyond entanglement, mm -hmm. uh, if you're thinking about that, so, so is there maybe a way that you would say, okay, anchor and positive sample, you already destroy entanglement in a specific way, um, uh, and maybe then you learn something else that is stored in the circuit? I'm not sure I fully understand. Um, you're, you're, you're asking if, if it might learn something that is not related to area law or volume law. Exactly, and if you maybe have to modify the setup such that you already, between the anchor and the positive sample, destroy the entanglement such that it does not learn that. Yeah, yeah, I think, we, I mean, we, we're just starting that, uh, so that, uh, um, excellent suggestion. That's, yeah, we'll try, we'll talk more. Yeah, that's right. good. Yeah. Uh, well then, let's thank Everett again.